So the title of my talk is Geology and Hydro Hydrology. I'm going to focus, though, on uh, uh, very heavily on the geology side. Um, I thought what I'd do today is sort of give you uh, an overview of the variety of investigations going on currently uh, into the geology of the High Plains Aquifer. And I'll bring together studies from different groups, uh, most of which I've, in, I've been involved in to one degree or another. Um, but I do have to give credit. Uh, the number of agencies involved in these different studies is, is really quite large. It would probably fill up an entire slide, and I wasn't able to get one together quite in time, but it, it involves the U.S. Geological Survey, um, a large number of the natural resources districts in Nebraska, the Kansas Geological Survey, the University of Nebraska, um, and, and many others. I'm probably leaving a lot of them out. Um, I have a relatively small number of co-authors compared to the number of people involved, so um, if I've left anyone out, I, I do apologize in advance. I want to start off by uh, talking about this man, Nelson Horatio Darton, uh, because he was sort of the, the pioneer in geological research of the High Plains Aquifer. Um, this is, he really has a, an amazing record. By the age of 17, he was elected to the American Chemical Society, and by the age of 20, he had, he had uh, numerous publications in different mineralogical journals. Um, he was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, he was hired by the U.S. Geological Survey in the late 1800s and was shortly thereafter sent out uh, to the field to conduct geological mapping, re uh, reconnaissance geological mapping, so areas that had never been mapped previously. Um, and just the, the uh, variety and, and area of coverage um, that uh, Mr. Darton was, was able to compile over his career is, is pretty staggering. He produced maps all the way from uh, parts of New York State all the way to California, covering huge areas. Um, so his record is, is really stellar. He named and described many of the um, bedrock formations that comprise the High Plains Ogallala Aquifer System. Most of you will recognize uh, Chimney Rock here on the upper left, um, he named and described the Brule Clay, which forms the uh, lowermost part of the aquifer system in parts of the northern High Plains aquifer. Also the Garing Formation, um, the Arikari Group, and the Ogallala uh, Group or Formation, depending on which state you're in. Described their characteristics, um, their thicknesses in, in the outcropping areas of western Nebraska and sort of laid the foundation for future researchers such as myself. So this is the uh, regional picture of the geology of the High Plains Aquifer that we have today. Um, a very basic explanation here is provided. We have several different units of tertiary age. Um, these are mostly siltstones, sandstones. Um, the Brule Formation I mentioned occurs mostly in Nebraska and Wyoming. It's a fine-grained unit, siltstone. Doesn't generally yield much water unless it's fractured. The Arikari Group and Ogallala Formation. The Ogallala uh, comprises most of the High Plains Aquifer in states such as Texas, Oklahoma, um, New Mexico and Colorado. And then in Nebraska and Kansas, we have a variety of younger units as well, which I have um, outlined here in this graphic. Um, the main point here is that the High Plains Ogallala system is a complex unit of multiple geologic formations um, that overlap in space. And what we get from this graphic is sort of this layered structure of this aquifer system. Well, it's actually much more complex than that, and so the remainder of the talk will uh, focus on trying to resolve some of those complexities, some of those local details, so that we can uh, do a better job of managing on a local level. 
So this graphic sort of outlines why we need more complex geological information for, as inputs to groundwater models. Um, the upper blocks here, this is a simplified conceptual model of a uh, sort of layer cake geometry um, that Darton first envisaged, envisaged for the uh, High Plains Aquifer. We know now today that this layer cake model doesn't really apply, especially at a local level. Um, we have much more of a labyrinth-like geometry of many of these sandstone bodies. And if we're going to build groundwater models, we need to know something about this three-dimensional architecture at various scales, not only at the outcrop scale, but at, uh, uh, say, county and township scales, as well as the regional geology, uh, the regional stratigraphy into which uh, these, these finer complexities fit. So the approach of this talk will start off with um, examples of some studies that I've been involved in looking at um, the, the uh, small scale variability in some of the geologic units exposed in Nebraska. We'll move on to uh, slightly larger scale um, regional systems using electromagnetics. And then we'll finally look at the basin fill scale geology, uh, incorporating some work from the Kansas Geological Survey. So starting here at the uh, level of individual beds and uh, depositional elements. This is some work that I've been conducting with my colleague Matt Jokel in western Nebraska, right here around uh, Lake McConaughey. Um, there's actually some pretty good exposures of the Ogallala in this area along the beaches and as well as at the uh, Kingsley Dam. Um, generally, Ogallala, uh, Ogallala rocks aren't well exposed in Nebraska. This area is an exception. So it offers an opportunity to explore in detail those uh, characteristics, physical attributes of the aquifer at outcrop scale. Right here on the, <clears throat> the right, we have a cross section through uh, about 30 kilometers of the Ogallala Group from south of the South Platte River Valley going up to the Lake McConaughey area. And you can see a variety of uh, geologic materials in the Ogallala, and we have some what are probable uh, channel bodies or um, valley fill elements here near the base of the Ogallala. The main point here is that the overwhelming majority of the Ogallala uh, in this area consists of finely interbedded uh, siltstones and fine sandstones. And uh, these coarser grain sandstones and gravel units really are a volumetric minority. And that's true for most areas in Nebraska. So all these, um, these uh, high yield irrigation wells that we have are just pumping from very great thicknesses of actually very uh, fine sandstone uh, and even coarse siltstone. This is a detailed diagram of the stratigraphy at Kingsley Dam. So if you've ever been out to Lake McConaughey and you've dri driven over Highway 61 over the dam, uh, as you come from north to south, right before you get onto the dam, we have the spillway. And in that spillway, which has been excavated, um, we have man-made exposures. These are some of the best exposures of the ash hollow formation of the Ogallala Group in Nebraska. And so we've measured a number of sections in this area, and they're arranged here on the bottom in, uh, in their vertical succession to scale. The, uh, these graphic logs, if you're not familiar with them, the farther the log is to the right, the coarser grained. And so you can see here we have, for example, silt, uh, silt stones and very fine sandstones. And the majority of the sediments in this area consist of siltstones and very fine sandstones. The main point I want to make here is that it's not just a simple pile of sand. Um, it's actually highly variable. And there are multiple lithologic units or units with similar physical characteristics that um, we can subdivide this 
the stratigraphy into. And so what we're trying to do now is now relate those, those lithologic units to uh, their hydrologic characteristics, or their permea permeability characteristics. We've been using a, a handheld air permeometer. We, we can actually go up to the outcrop and pump air into uh, these rocks to um, get a sense of the relative permeability of these different units. And in this diagram, we have a photograph of the uh, Kingsley Spillway right down here in C. And above that, a slightly zoomed in interpretation uh, of the spillway exposure. Now, it's, this is quite detailed, but the main point I want to get across here is that the lithologic units that we've defined out here are arranged into a complex series of depositional elements that change character along the, the length of that outcrop. Uh, this is a 2D outcrop, but you can imagine in three dimensions, this would even be more complex. And we have a variety of uh, channel fill elements, um, some thick, massive sandstone elements with a variety of uh, soil um, paleosol features indicative of ancient soils that have been buried. And just some photographs of those lithologic units. So we've developed a, a very general uh, conceptual model of these deposits out here to describe the possible vertical connections between different aquifer subunits. Um, these darker bands you see here would be uh, sort of baffles or barriers between aquifer subunits. Um, you might call them confining units. And then the lighter stippled patterns would be the, the coarser units that would uh, yield the most groundwater. And connections between those units would occur where we have channel bodies that are incised into or eroded down uh, through the finer grain units. And we, we envision the uh, Middle Loop River in Nebraska as, as a possible modern analog to this system. Now, this is a little bit of a change in the way we think about these units because most times when, when uh, geologists describe the Ogallala, uh, they talk about very large river systems, uh, maybe similar to the Brahmaputra or, or um, uh, maybe even the, the Platte River, uh, things like that. But the scale and the geometry of these units suggest actually moderately sized river systems like the Loop River, at least for the area uh, that we studied. So using those analogs, you can start to get an, a sense of the um, spatial scale of the different depositional elements, which you can't get in a simple 2D cross section. Um, we can get things like um, lateral sand body geometry and thicknesses. So moving on now to uh, slightly um, uh, broader scale studies of facies, bodies, and sequences. Uh, this is work that's being conducted uh, by the natural resources districts in collaboration with uh, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Conservation and Survey Division at UNL, um, funding from a variety of sources, including the Environmental Trust, um, as well as the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, I'm going to do my best to explain how aerial electromagnetics works. Um, basically, you have a geophysical tool suspended from a helicopter and in this set, set up, setup, we have a loop system where a current flows around that loop, and that current is periodically interrupted or stopped for short moments. And it's, as a result of that interruption, we have a time-varying magnetic field um, that is produced that then interacts with conductive materials in the Earth. And that interac interaction induces eddy currents in the ground, those eddy currents then produce secondary magnetic fields that are picked up by receivers in this coil. And this little animation here sort of shows how those currents travel through a simple two-layer model of the Earth and the apparent resistivity curve that would be generated at that location. 
So they, so they do this for numerous locations along a flight line, and each of those curves then is combined into a 2D profile, and they can use numerous algorithms and geophysical methods to come up with a resistivity depth profile. This is a, a simple, uh, simplified diagram showing uh, one of those resistivity depth models for an alluvial aquifer. Now, the conductivity of the earth is controlled by a number of different uh, uh, factors, physical and chemical, um, things like porosity, water chemistry, uh, mineralogy of the soils and the subsurface, as well as organic content and, and a number of other things. But in the areas where we've worked, uh, we've applied this system in Nebraska, there's a general relationship between um, the uh, particle size of the sediments or the sedimentary rocks and the conductivity of those units. So we can think of the cooler colors such as blue and green as finer grain sediment and the warmer colors, red and orange, as coarser grain sandstones and siltstones or aquifer units. Um, so we have this example of this alluvial setting where we have a multi-layered aquifer system which is imaged by the electromagnetic survey coarse sands near the surface, a layer of finer sediments, and then fine sands at depth. So I'm going to give you a series of three-dimensional diagrams um, that will illustrate um, the application of this technology in two different areas of Nebraska. Uh, on one end, we have the aerial electromagnetic surveys that we've conducted in eastern Nebraska. This is part of the eastern Nebraska water resources assessment. Um, in cooperation with six NRDs. The map on your right shows all the different flight paths of these surveys um, that have been conducted and then a planned flight survey for this spring um, in southeast Nebraska. This is an example of a geologic cross-section constructed from boreholes recently in northeast Nebraska along this line from Pierce to Dakota counties. I'll point out a number of bedrock units here, all dipping towards the west or tilted towards the west. The green units, these are Cretaceous um, shales and limestones. The orange color here with a TO is the Ogallala. So we're right on the fringes of the High Plains Aquifer. And then the multicolored units above it are uh, quaternary sediments some of which are also part of the High Plains Aquifer. And this is the uh, resistivity depth profile generated along a uh, flight path which is parallel to that cross section. And you can see um, resistors here suggesting um, that aquifers are present and then conductors in blue suggesting shales and, and uh, clays. Now, if we take both of these sections and combine them into one diagram, making them transparent, and I've outlined the uh, geologic bedrock contacts for your convenience, you can see there's a very good match between the electromagnetic results and the interpreted stratigraphy in this area. So this is very promising um, for, for our attempts to image sort of the deeper subsurface, which we've shown down here. The, the, um, time domain system uh, can image down to depths of something like 1,200 feet or, or uh, a little over 300 meters, um, which is really pretty good. That exceeds the typical depth of investigation of our bore, borehole drilling program. This is an example of some of these surveys around Oakland, Nebraska, also in the northeastern part of the state, right on the fringes of the High Plains Aquifer. Um, you see a a uh, detailed survey right in here. This is about 16 kilometers north to south for scale. This detailed survey was conducted in 2007, 2007 using a different configuration. It gave us a very detailed picture of some of the stratigraphy, but didn't quite reach the depths that we needed in this area. So it was resurveyed, um, although not at the same um, 
scale of resolution uh, in 2014 using time domain system. It's a different configuration that allows for deeper imaging. And you can see we've, we've got way down here into um, Paleozoic rocks, which is really quite interesting. Another view of the, that same area, I think we're looking to the southwest. Um, you can see these reds here. This is the alluvial aquifer system along Logan Creek. And then you can see the, the deeper images from the uh, 2014 system uh, survey, which are overlaid on top of it. So, so this, this method, application of this method, um, is, is really revolutioning, revolutionizing our ability to create three-dimensional conceptualizations of aquifer systems. We've also done quite a bit of this work out west in the Panhandle, um, in the uh, North Platte, South Platte, and Twin Platte NRDs, and a number of studies out in the Sand Hills as well uh, associated with uh, some uh, hydrologic studies out there. And I don't have time to get into all of them, but this is just a, a quick look at one of those surveys. I think it was from 2009 or around there, uh, published in 2012. And we're looking at the North Platte River Valley. You can see, see here this contrast between warmer and cooler colors. That's the bedrock contact at the base of the alluvium in the, in the Platte River Valley. Um, you can see a, a bedrock high right in here. I want to say this is broad water formation, but I, I can't recall right offhand. Um, so this is giving us a new ability to conceptualize these aquifer systems. And you can imagine if, if we combine the detailed facies analysis presented in the first part of the talk with something like this, we can begin to piece together um, all the different components of the heterogeneity of these aquifer systems. And then finally, um, very quickly, I'll try to summarize the work being done at the Kansas Geological Survey. I am not a geochemist, but I will pretend to be one for the next five minutes. Um, this work is, is being conducted by a whole consortium of people in Kansas. Um, they've worked with the uh, Nebraska Survey as well on different aspects of the project. So the basic premise here is that um, in order to understand the, the stratigraphy of the High Plains Aquifer at the largest scales, at the broadest scale, the regional type of scale, um, we have to have uh, better control on the, the geochronology of the age dates of these sediments when they were laid down so that we can correlate uh, between different areas of the aquifer. Um, the premise for this part of their study is that uh, certain ash fall um, minerals, uh, things that are um, ejected into the atmosphere by volcanoes, things like zircon crystals, are datable by um, uh, radiochemistry. We can get actual absolute age dates on these crystals. Now, typically, we use things like sandstones to uh, find zircon crystals. But the problem with that in the Ogallala is those sandstones have been reworked many times. And so what you have are um, these, these datable minerals represent a conglomeration of all different ages because they've been reworked so many times. And so what they're trying to do at Kansas is look at uh, paleosols, uh, these ancient buried soils. Um, the idea is that uh, this ash falls down onto these soils. It's incorporated into the soil um, through different uh, bioturbation activity. And it's, it's not reworked. It's preserved um, as, as a specific time window into those sediments. So the first thing they have to do is actually identify buried soils, which isn't quite as easy as you think. Um, but when they do identify those soils, they take samples. Um, break down those samples and then look for those zircon crystals and here are some preliminary age dates from one of their cores in northern Kansas. The other aspect of their work is looking at stable isotope chemostratigraphy. Basic idea here is that um, uh, carbon isotopes have a specific fingerprint that, um, that relate to different carbon uh, isotope fraction fractionation processes. Uh, where carbon 
<clears throat> isotopes are incorporated into soils as either organic matter or pedogenic carbonate. So you can see some of the basic curves that they're using to, as a basis for comparison and some of their preliminary results um, from one of their cores again. Now this, uh, this type of work gives us the broadest scale. It would allow us, if we could get um, a number of these curves from different areas, to correlate between those areas and then fit um, into those correlations the more detailed picture from things like uh, electromagnetics, detailed facies analysis, to come up with a, uh, a full-blown three-dimensional three visualization of the aquifer that we can use to refine groundwater models. Thank you. Oh, uh, one last map just showing where uh, the Kansas survey has been working. You can see most of that work has been conducted in Kansas. Uh, we're incorporating some sites from Nebraska as well. Questions? Yes. Yeah, I agree. I have not looked at that personally. Um, I think that's something that's worth look, looking into, but no, I have not conducted those studies. Yes, sir. Yes, I was interested in the comments you were making about the sort of scale of fluvial processes that was producing the form of the mining of the crop. Mm -hmm. Does your dissertation go into that much greater? Um, actually, this. Uh, talk doesn't present my dissertation, <laughs> but um, that's something we're we're planning on uh, continuing those studies to look into uh, the three dimensionality of those fluvial sand bodies. The outcrops at Kingsley Dam are just one window into this very complex system. So I think if we if we characterize a, uh, a number of different locations and get a range of sand body geometries that might help us to, to come up with a better um, uh, model for how they were formed. Certainly the, the loop rivers aren't the perfect analog, but it's a start to begin looking at um, the range of these different architectural elements. Let's, uh, let's give Jesse a big hand.